Hey everybody, welcome to The Social Dig. I'm your host, Mr. Rob G. And like always, we're gonna be digging into the topics that keep you talking and the talk that keeps you thinking. So come on in, get comfortable, pour an ice cold beverage and get ready to join the conversation. Of course, like always, I got my guy, the engineer at The Social Dig here, Mr. Mateo. What's up, brother? How are you? Brother from another mother. <laughs> Indeed. Man, I, 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 I'm so glad that you're here with me today. Uh, so glad that we could be here with our audience today. Indeed. Glad to be here, too. How's um, everything out in uh, in in so- soggy California? Yes, yeah, soggy California. For a change. Thank, thank God for yeah. that. Yeah, we got, we're getting a lot of rain here. We need it, obviously. It's been... For the last few years, pretty pretty dang dry out here. Um, we have a river. Uh, it's like I said, I'm in Bakersfield here, and we have a river that flows right through the city. Usually, it's bone dry, and actually, right now we're getting we uh, have a pretty good flow coming through. So, nice. how's everything out there in Florida? What's your weather like? It's good. It's been. It's actually we're reaching the height of our dry season, and it's been pretty dry. We've uh, we had a so this is when the fires start burning in the Everglades and all that stuff. And then come mid-May, the sky opens up and that's the rainy season. So I think we're kind of normal here, I'll say. Normal for what typical is going on. Nothing too dry, nothing too wet. So hopefully we get through this dry peak and get through, get to the wet season and all will be good. Well, hey, like Spring I break said- is in full effect too. So it's, it's happening down here. Oh, oh, right, right, right. Spring break in Florida. Oh, I wish I could be there, man. Mm-hmm. Good Lord, I wish I could be there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't need to tell you what that's like. No, exactly. Yeah, uh, so here, here's what we'll do. You know, I'm just glad to be. I'm just feeling good. I, I'm almost don't want to jump right into it, but I guess that's what we'll do. Uh, we, we have a good show for you planned today. So let's go ahead and actually jump into our disclosure news to get things started. We go ahead and do. All right, so today. This week in Disclosure News, crazy stuff going on. Mateo, have you heard about Mm -hmm. the Russian fighter in the drone incident? Yes, I have. Very interesting. It's still uh, hot news and the reactions are... Well, how it ends up is still pending, but I, I, I read today people are talking and officials are talking, trying to defuse the situation, of course. Right. And I, I have to give props out. I just have to do it because I was watching Spaced Out Radio last night and a, a gentleman by the name of Random Guy alluded to something big going on, uh, something very serious going on, something that we should have been concerned about. Um, you know, at the time it wasn't reported that this incident had taken place, uh, but he kind of alluded to something that could potentially lead us to, to going into war and, uh, you know, took it with a grain of salt, wake up this morning and here is sure enough, we have this story on the plate. So kind of just jumping into it, uh, just, uh, what I had saw from this, it, it, it's saying that a Russian jet fighter or fighter jet rather struck the propeller of a U.S. surveillance drone over the Black Sea on Tuesday in a brazen violation of international law, causing American forces to bring down the unmanned aer- aerial vehicle, the U.S. said. But Russia insisted its warplanes did, did, didn't hit the M- Q9 Reaper drone. Instead, it said the drone maneuvered sharply and crashed into the water following an encounter with Russian fighter jets that had been scrambled to intercept it near Crimea. 
So not really, you know, as we don't like to get political here and kind of get into all the who who's uh who's wrong for this who's wrong for that but it's an important topic only because it is something that directly affects humanity and truthfully uh you know i think it's just at least worth us mentioning we we'd be doing a disservice not to mention it so what is your view what is your what is your take on that uh as far as the seriousness of of what we're looking at potentially or what what this could lead to and how it would affect us as humanity well a couple things one is and you may have read this detail the way that the jet the russian fighter took down the drone is by dumping fuel in front of it which then fouled the propeller apparently obviously a propeller isn't meant to pump water, liquid. It's meant to pump air, right? So that actually, I think, bent or damaged the propeller, which, you know, in a rainstorm, of course, propellers can handle that. But, I mean, a big deluge of fuel apparently brought was enough to foul the engine and, and bring it down. That tells me that the Russians weren't trying to be, you know, they, did, they could have shot it down, right? Of course. But that would have been a little bit more too provocative provocative thank you that's the right word so this was kind of a gentle way of saying you got too close now the debate about whether the drone was in international waters or not is still raging russians said no americans said yes who knows what the gps says of course so as far as the outcome i honestly don't think there's going to be world war three over this and it's unfortunate because of just the whole you know the whole the whole thing and what's going on over there is just part of the bigger picture but let me tell you one thing that bothers me about this whole thing and it kind of goes back to the whole chinese balloon incident and everything else apparently the americans have already said that they are going to have trouble recovering the wreckage at all in the black sea and of course the russians are like saying oh yeah we're going to go after it so i'm like man it, the, 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 the sense I get, and, and I hate to say this because I'm a big supporter of the U.S. and the U.S. military and appreciate everything our servicemen do. But why does it seem like the U.S. military is so inept when it comes to recovering like downed stuff like this? It seems mm. what's going on there. Anyway, that that was my reaction to the, the two aspects, you know, as far as where it's going to lead and the aftermath here where we're not going to be able to get the thing back now. I, you know, obviously you don't want the drone to fall into the hands of the adversaries so they can reverse engineer it, but who knows? It could be a bluff too. You know, maybe it is lost and it's at the bottom and the Russians don't have a chance of getting it either, but of course they're going to say otherwise. And from what I hear, I guess we don't have any ships in the Black Sea, so we, we, we're we going to be late to the party trying late to, to it, yeah. locate it anyway. So they're already there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are assuming that they may recover it first. So what that means, uh, really can't say because we don't know uh, what type of technology is on, you know, is on the drone or what are they, what would they actually get aside from being able to maybe back engineer it? I don't yeah, know exactly. what else would they get out of that. So that's what everybody's after. And it's more of an embarrassment than it is. Uh, I, I mean, I think a, a strategic issue, it's more of an embarrassment, but anyhow. It, it, and it's just, it, you know, it's especially coming off the tail of the balloon debacle. Uh, and then mm-hmm. you have this, I mean, it, it, you know, it's obvious that there is a direction that, that, uh they're pushing an agenda that they're pushing so um i kind of want to let that play out before i really give my opinion on it because that's a a deep hole that you could fall into Mm -hmm. and and just really don't want to do that but um moving on just we had to cover that but let's just move on so we have uh our next story here which is mr avi Loeb, who was in the news for a report that was published uh, where he indicated, and actually I'll go ahead and get read that out to you. Let me move my banner off here though. So, okay, there we go. All right, so with Avi Loeb, so 
Pentagon officials said in a draft document last week that aliens could be visiting our solar system and releasing smaller probe like missions conducted by NASA when studying other planets. A draft research report authored by Sean Kirkpatrick, the director of the Pentagon's All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or Arrow, and Abraham Loeb, or Avi Loeb, chairman of Harvard University's astronomy department, was released on March 7th and focuses on the physical constraints of unidentified aerial phenomenon. An artificial, this is a quote from Avi Loeb, an artificial interstellar object could potentially be a parent craft that releases many small probes during its close passage to Earth, an operational construct not too dissimilar from NASA missions, the report read. These dandelion seeds could be separated from the parent craft by the tidal gravitational force of the sun or by a maneuver, maneuvering capability. And with proper design, these tiny probes would reach the Earth or other solar system planets for exploration as the parent craft passes by within a fraction of the Earth to Sun separation, just like Oumuamua did, uh, the authors wrote. Astronomers would not be able to notice the spray of many probes because they do not reflect enough sunlight for existing survey telescopes to notice them. Hmm, what do you think about that? Certainly plausible, right? I mean, makes I, sense. I, I mean, any interstellar object is of interest. Avi Loeb obviously has a uh, history with Oumuamua, of course, uh, being the discoverer and the primary investigator. And he's a, a little obsessed with interstellar objects as a result. And that's OK. We can't hold that against him. But he, he, well, there's a lot going on there that no one has noticed because like a Muamua, we missed it when it was coming in. We only saw it when it was leaving. And right. how many other objects have come and gone, right, that we've missed? Not because we're not looking, but you can't look everywhere in the sky at the same time. And as right. you just said, stuff's not easy to, to detect. And so, yes, it's it's certainly plausible that that could be the case. We just... Uh, now we're just finally have the technology to be able to see this stuff on occasion. And when we do, it's piquing people's interest because they're like, hey, that's not from here and it's leaving again. Where did it come from? What is it? And how often does this actually happen? And the answer is it's a lot more often than anyone originally thought. Now, I kind of can, can understand there being potentially a mothership with probes being released. I I personally believe that the orbs and and even my own UFO incident were actual probes, unmanned craft, alien craft, but unmanned alien craft. So I could kind of go with this. Now, whether they're uh, parked somewhere out in the solar system uh, near Earth and releasing these probes, I don't know. I would be more leaning towards what the topic of the show is today, that that if there is a mothership, there, there has to be a mothership, that these are coming from under the ocean. If anything, I'm thinking these probes or these the, the mothership, just my own opinion, under the ocean, they're releasing these probes out. They're going about their business around the world, whatever they're doing. And then they're going back to the mothership or or in some instances, as as we have heard in other reports of orbs kind of exploding into like molten metal almost uh, and disappearing. So I'm figuring that potentially maybe these probes are only good for so long uh, and then they self-destruct essentially or or vaporize or, or kind of go away. The, you, you know what I'm trying to say there? Mm -hmm. No, I agree. They're, they're like drones. They're just expendable drones, if you will. Expendable or, drones. Yeah, exactly. They, they're exactly. sending them out, collecting information. And if they don't get them back or they, they self-destruct so nobody could discover them. Yeah. 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 I mean, and it would make sense uh, that those would be unmanned craft. Is mm -hmm. it just, it, it never sat right with me 
uh, why, you know, a UFO, if it was manned, would spontaneously just self-destruct. It just didn't make sense. But the fact that them being probes makes total sense then. But yeah, I believe there there is a mothership under the water, most likely could be in the solar system. But that's kind of what we're going to be getting into today. So I was kind of glad that that this came out. A lot of people didn't put too much behind uh, what was said here. But if you and this is one of the things I always say, the, the pieces of the puzzle that we already have. And then we take these other pieces, put the whole picture together. This mm -hmm. for me would have been another piece of that puzzle. So even though it didn't seem like it was heavy information, it actually uh, was pretty valid and plays a part into how we look at this. Agreed. He wouldn't be saying this unless there was some basis for what for it. And the government wouldn't be receiving it in a report if, it, if there wasn't some basis for it. So, you know, these mall, it all comes out like rumor or hearsay, but in the end, there may be some truth behind this. And like you just said, it's a piece to the puzzle that uh, we have to all have to help put together. And it's, and, and I've just, a lot of people have been giving Avi Loeb a lot of, a lot of flack for uh, his affiliation with certain groups um, and mm -hmm. what his ulterior motives might be. But then he comes with something like this and it's like, well, why would he do that if he was playing for the other side? Doesn't make sense to me. I'm not, I'm still in the middle with Abi Loeb. I still value the information that he gives. And I still think that uh, he still has a, 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 a role to play in some of the things that happen going forward. So yes. I would love to see what happens with his uh uh Galileo project. Yeah. Well not the Galileo, but the uh the the venture where he's going out into the ocean to oh yes locate Papua yeah. New Guinea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To find that uh, meteor that was also believed to be interstellar. Yes. Exactly. So yeah, hopefully something comes from that. I have faith yeah. in them. A lot of people have written them off for whatever reason, but I guess a lot of that going on in ufology right now. So uh, kind of it's kind of not good, but yeah. I mean, uh, with that being said, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry, you broke up for a minute, and I was talking. Yeah, I just said he's doing the best that he can in light of the critics and in light of you know the job at hand. So it's slow growing and so yeah people i, I want to see results so you know i can even be critical at some time as well but we have to be patient definitely so yeah i mean with that being said that's pretty much the news that we have today i want to get right into this topic so let's get out of the news mm -hmm. and go into our main subject for today which is going to be USOs, uh, underwater submerged objects. So this is something that I think about all the time because I am right here in uh, California, Southern California, about 120 miles from Catalina Island, mm -hmm. where we know there's been reported a lot of activity. Um, Kevin Day, which we're actually going to talk about next. Mr. Kevin Day, Navy radar operator for the U.S. Nimitz, uh, back in the 2004 Tic Tac incident. So Kevin Day famously reported tracking UFOs or UAP dropping from 80,000 feet to sea level and also observed on radar objects heading towards Catalina Island. Kevin was also featured in Terror, uh, Terror in the Sky, the documentary by director Caroline Corey, where the UAP had been seen both above water and, and below. So it's been theorized that there may actually be extraterrestrial bases beneath the oceans near Catalina Island. I know Jimmy Church reported on that some years back. Um, and then obviously in the community, there's been talk about potential bases being in Antarctica, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, some things that happened in Russia, and then obviously other spots around the globe. I mean, you have to think about it. The earth is 70% water. 
there's a lot of unmonitored ocean out there. I mean, they could come and go all day long and we would never know. And they're doing it, obviously. Uh, I, I, I don't want to say the ladies. I think her name was Kathy Hall. Something I, I'm I, I'm not sure what her name was, but she has a channel where she had a video of UAP down by Antarctica in South America in a part of the ocean where um, you know not not a lot of travel happens. So did you see that? I did not see that, but I know what you're talking about, and. Um that was really interesting or that that whole topic is interesting in that area because there's another area of the world that's not closely monitored a lot could be going on there yeah i mean when you think about it there's a, with 70 percent of the globe being water there's just I mean, anywhere not near land i mean if you're not a sailor or you're not in like a shipping lane or uh somewhere where the military is is, is doing exercises then it's pretty much just uh, free for all and they come and go as they please. And, you know, I want to question if there is a threat narrative potentially associated with that. So I cut, we'll kind of go over some cases and then at the end there, there's some that might make you think twice. So mm -hmm. just starting off, obviously, uh, Agua de, or actually, no, we'll, we'll go with 1963. Puerto Rico. There's the USS Wasp. I'll go ahead and bring that up. It's uh, amphibious. It's an amphibious assault ship. So in 1963, oh, this is actually the map for Catalina. So actually, just so you can see, this is Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Catalina Islands right off the coast, about 20 miles. And that's where all the activity happened. That's where they did the tear in the sky. Um, that's where Kevin Day saw all the UAP heading towards that direction. And this is the USS Wasp. So in 1963, the United States Navy had a fleet of ships, submarines, and aircraft off the coast of Puerto Rico performing training in anti-submarine maneuvers with the USS Wasp, an aircraft carrier serving as the command ship. During the exercises, the vessels detected an unknown sonar target moving in the area. One of the submarines moved to pursue and investigate. The submarine could not catch it. For four days, the fleet tracked the unknown object and recorded it and recorded that it moved at more than 150 knots, which is over 170 miles per hour, and descended to over 27,000 feet deep now the fleet commander or the fleet communicated this encounter to their navy, naval base at norfolk virginia at the time of this incident just so you know for comparison at the time of the incident the top speed of submarines was 45 knots and their greatest depth that they could go at that time was it shows 3,000 feet so uh, do you think 27,000 feet Definitely not anything that, that's going to be man-made back in, in 1963. Uh, have you heard about this case? What do you think about that? I had not heard about this particular case, but I, I find all of these cases just really interesting because of, especially this one, in 1963, the technology that was available then. Propelling yourself at high speeds in water takes a massive amount of energy. We all know that. I mean, you look at the horsepower people put on their boats just so that they could do like 50 miles an hour, right? It's right. ridiculous. And when you're submerged, it's even tougher, right? Because you've got all this resistance. And so that's one high speed underwater is one thing that it's almost like one of the five observables, right? It's like the sixth observable. If you're going fast under the water, that's anomalous right there, Period. right? Right period. The speed of sound underwater, by the way, I looked this up because I thought it was interesting. The speed of sound in air is about 740 miles an hour at sea level. In water, the speed of sound is 3,300 miles an hour. Wow. You can, sound moves very quickly in water. So you can go pretty fast in water and not have to worry about making a sonic boom, so to speak, or shockwave. Uh, and 
I have heard other stories, and I'm sure you'll cover them, um, cover a few of them, where even objects underwater are moving even faster. But I, I, I find that interesting. The depth, the extreme depth, I mean, that's another challenge. Of course, we know you can't change depth easily or quickly. Back then, the submarines could only go so far because of just structural limitations. Where did you say this was occurring exactly? This was uh, this was off the coast of Puerto Rico. Oh, that makes sense because Catalina Island, I was looking at this earlier too because I'm always intrigued. We were talking about oceans and 70%. The bottom of the ocean is not even monitored at all, right? It, the top of the ocean is one area that's completely not always monitored, but imagine at these depths. Catalina's got a trench right off of it that's about 6,000 feet right. deep, which is pretty dramatic given how steep that drop off is. It's over a mile, yeah. But in Puerto Rico, I was just looking at that Puerto Rico trench is one of the deepest spots. I think it is, in fact, the deepest spot in the entire Atlantic, and it goes down about that far. The Marianas Trench is 36,000 feet, which is the deepest thing in the world. The wow. Puerto Rico trench is like 30,000 feet. So, yes, it could have gone 27,000 feet deep. Imagine that. That's like That's five miles. It's, yeah, it's five roughly, miles, man. Yeah. It, it's ridiculous. So, no, we do not possess any technology that can do that. And yeah. back then, of course. Uh, so, right. yeah, it, it's all very intriguing, very interesting. And you can't deny the fact that. This was anomalous. And if you see, I mean, if you see what the subs looked like in 1963, they, no comparison to what no. we have today by far. No. Now, Not at all. since we're in Puerto Rico, obviously one of the more famous USO incidents was the uh, Aguadilla, Aguadilla, yes. Puerto Rico. And for those who may not know what that was, Let's go ahead and check out the video of the craft in Aguadilla. So this is going. You should see it. Okay, it's going over the water here. Yep. underwater wow without breaking stride and then i think yeah we see it again this is where it splits into two mm -hmm. then re-emerged so so what was the background on this one i i remember i think i remember it too but you, you have this document. What was the background on this? When and where and by whom? Uh, I know this was in 2013. I don't know if it was the Coast Guard. I'm not sure what branch it was. Uh, I think but it was like it was a Border Patrol. Or a border was it Border Customs? Patrol? Yeah. Okay. Plane, one of their surveillance planes was on a mission and it picked this thing up and turned on its infrared. Yeah, I mean, but you obviously see that uh, that's not a man-made object. You can definitely understand that by looking at that and how it doesn't break stride, no drag once mm -hmm. it hits the water. Um, so that's that's proof right there that there are UFOs under the water, just that alone. So yeah. that's going to make everything else that you hear from this point forward even more compelling because there's your proof that these things are underwater. So... Obviously, the next uh, one we'll get to is the more famous, and actually, I, I don't have a clip of this. I do have an image, is the um, incident from the, is the USS Omaha, I believe. Let's mm -hmm. see. One point on that uh, Aguadilla incident, because Rich Hoffman from the SCU did analyze it on a, yeah. on a TV show once. He did. They did verify that that object was moving against the wind, so it wasn't a balloon or anything like that. There was some people who said, "Ah, that's a balloon," and blah blah blah. 
no bullets. It was going sense. against the wind, and that's that was proven. So anyhow, and on. a blue and a balloon going underwater. Yeah, no, no, that. of course not. Right, <laughs> so that doesn't work either. So yeah, this is USS Omaha. This is uh, the video Jeremy Corbell uh, ended up bringing out from the U.S. government. It's been all over TV. Yep. Everyone's seen this. Um, where, where just, uh, the video that leaked, uh, is the U S Naval personnel having a close encounter with the UFO, a spherical object that makes a controlled descent into the ocean. As we saw, um, the object was filmed by a cameraman aboard the USS Omaha as it sailed off the coast of San Diego back in July, 2019, two unidentified crew members could be heard exclaiming, while it splashed after the ball made a controlled flight over the ocean, then splashed into the sea and disappeared underwater. And as far as I know, this was at night, right? Yes. Was, okay. So 11 o'clock, I saw dark. that too. I didn't know that until I recently looked at it. That's why the object, the video is the way it is, because it's all infrared. They couldn't have mm -hmm. been visible at 11 o'clock at night. Well, just imagine though. So had you, so say you're just on a boat yourself mm -hmm. fishing out there pitch black you can't see anything and these things are flying out there like that you know mm -hmm. that's that's a crazy thing to wrap your mind around mm -hmm. and just just to preface all this i'm doing this show on usos and uh it, i'm actually uh, we're booking a cruise <laughs> mm -hmm. we're, we're taking a cruise here in the next couple months and i'm sitting here i'm telling i'm like hey there's things out there now don't mm -hmm. think that there aren't things out there. So don't be surprised when we're on this cruise, if we encounter something out here in the water, because they are for sure there. We may have to borrow some of uh, of our friend uh, Tim Senor's in, uh, infrared viewing equipment to bring with you so you can yeah. get up on deck and well, be looking around because you would never know these things are there. And and for, for nighttime, night. for sure. Yeah. I'm almost anticipating because I know they're there. So I'm not going to be able to enjoy myself. I'm going to full time. I'm sure be on the lookout for UAP. I just know I am. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, I am feel sorry for my girl. Cause she doesn't want to hear that. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't want to hear any of that. She wants to enjoy herself. Exactly. We're supposed to go to her team. And she, she already told me, she said, Hey, we get out of here. <laughs> Don't start. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I will. I promise I will try. I will try. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you'll do a little bit of both. Of course, can't help it. But this next one is 2017. Now, this is one, uh, you know, researchers. I hadn't heard of this one, uh, but it's the 2017 Gulf of Mexico UFO. So a crew member of an offshore supply vessel in the Gulf of Mexico claimed he saw a UFO five times the size of his vessel and UFO trackers are now looking for more witnesses to come forward with any information possibly related to the sighting. The UFO encounter occurred in the Gulf of Mexico, approximately 80 miles Southeast of new Orleans, according to the, OSV chief engineer who submitted info of the sighting to the National UFO Reporting Center in New Fork, which apparently tracks UFO sightings and data. Now, this, this is a quote here, I guess. It states, close to 7 p.m. on March 21st, just before dusk, myself and four of the crew members aboard our vessel saw a craft that appeared to be five times our 240 foot vessel in length so it's a thousand feet roughly mm -hmm. 1200 feet uh Almost. my line of sight was about a quarter mile from our vessel there was a rig was they're talking about an oil rig uh out in the gulf mm -hmm. behind the craft about a half a mile i used this to help gauge the size of the craft sighting was approximately 80 miles southeast of new orleans louisiana he stayed. The scene lasted for about 40 minutes. The craft, the road, the craft rose up out of the water about 40 feet. No water was visible dripping from the craft. And then within a split second, the craft disappeared at a 30 degree angle into the sky. Speed appeared 
to be faster than the speed of a light turning on in a room. Within seconds, it had disappeared completely. It says, I can say for sure that the craft was dark colored, oval in shape, and made no sound whatsoever. Say, so with as many rigs, which was, I guess there was two, there has to be more witnesses than just the four on that particular vessel. So the New Fork uh, National UFO Reporting Center has even highlighted the sighting as being of particular interest among the 246 reports of UFOs received in March alone. And after speaking with the witness by phone, the National UFO Reporting Center said the report seems legit and has urged more witnesses to come forward. Said we spoke via telephone with this witness and he seemed to us to be unusually sober minded. New Fork wrote in a note added to the original report said we suspect that he is a very capable and very reliable witness. He estimates that upwards of perhaps 50 people who were aboard nearby vessels may have witnessed the event as well. And we urge those other witnesses to submit reports of what they had witnessed. So that's a big thing right there. And I know there's a thing going on right now where uh, just like I stated in, in, in earlier in ufology, where it's kind of a back and forth thing. Some people feel like you should trust these reporting agencies. Some people feel like maybe you shouldn't. Um, I know I report, I went, I, well, I did take maybe six months before I reported mines because I was just unsure of how they would handle it. And I talked to Tim Senor and Tim, um, kind of reaffirmed, uh, to me that MUFON, you know, took good care of his case and, uh, that I, I had a worry that they, because they have a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo mm -hmm. in the, uh, when you go ahead and sign up. So I was trying to make sure that they weren't taking ownership and, and exactly what the, the deal was there. But, um, I, I personally would say for sure, document your sighting and uh and and report it you have two two organizations move on and then new fork and just choose one and report it just report it think of the think of the the degree of this report too rob i mean you know we none of i never had heard of this and this is 2017 and by the way I mean, I fly when I go, let's say, fly to Texas or something to visit my sister and we go over the Gulf of Mexico here from Florida. It is jam packed with oil, offshore oil drilling rigs. So that stretch south of New Orleans where that resupply ship was going is frequently traveled. They're constantly bringing supplies, people back and forth to those rigs constantly. The work boat industry is huge. I do a lot of work and related to that in my business since it's Marine, but it's like a special Marine group. Mm -hmm. Imagine the number of sightings that happen that don't get documented. What this guy I reported, I mean, this guy reported it. That's a hotbed or that's like a super highway of activity. I'm sure they see things. And we all know that UAP seem oddly attracted to energy sources, be them nuclear power plants, hydroelectric plants, oil rigs, who knows what. And they're, there's these, they're not there because they're there for a reason. And who knows what they're doing, but that's the big question, of course. But I just find it very compelling that this person's report came out, and I bet you it is literally a drop in the ocean, no pun intended, because there's so much going on out there. There's so much activity. And if there were 50 other people, where's their testimony? What that tells me is this is happening a lot, and people just keep their mouth shut because hey, they don't want to lose their job. That's what I was going to say. The stigma all of that stuff you know in the oil industry is you know that, that's a hard that's a that's a that's a a tough job a tough industry to work in people you know but it's also lucrative so people don't want to lose their jobs there because they're making good money and you know it, it's one of those situations where you're going to keep your mouth shut shut so you can keep your job 
and your and what you're doing. So it, I bet you there's a lot going on there that we don't nobody well, knows about. Look, and you and you found a beautiful case right here. And that just shows you, just like you said, 50 people. So 50 people are just sitting there, closed mouth, holding this on their conscience for however long, maybe the rest of their lives. Maybe they take it to their deathbed, just like a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's and then so that that ends up being a problem, because when you look at it, that's why it seems like such a fringe topic, because there's only a percentage of people that are actually reporting so it seems like it's this small little group of people yep. and really it's a lot more than that it's and that's why i say in from my own sighting i keep referring to that because before my sighting i never had one my whole life i've been in places where i figured i might i, I should have seen something and i never did and then i had it and it was such a big event that if i didn't report it i would have been no better than mm -hmm. the 50 people that didn't report this. So right. that's why I, that's, that's why I just double down on urging people that first of all, if you see something recorded, first of all, right. And then report it, it does no good staying in your mind. It stays, it does no good for the rest of humanity staying right here. We all need to know about it because you know who is taking down the information? The government mm -hmm. and the people that are actually tracking these things. They have their track. They're writing everything down. And so they have all the information. So at the end of the day, we end up looking to them for the answers. When we if, if we do what we're supposed to do, we can tell the story ourselves. Yep. Amazing. Amazing. But moving on, we have uh, this one I couldn't really find too much on, but I did see something on it and it just mentions a 2018 in 2018, a small white object about the size of a boat doesn't really specify how big emerged from the water near Imperial Beach, California, raised up to 500 feet above the surface and shot off moving south. So moving on from that, and I think I have something for this. Was, this is probably the most recent um, popular sighting was the day Fravor Tic Tac, not necessarily the Tic Tac itself, but what he said was underneath the Tic Tac. They said it was something below the surface. It seemed like uh, that the Tic Tac was bouncing and moving across. So I want to talk about that because he, you know, obviously he's a pilot. He knows what submarines look like from the air. I'm sure he's seen them a thousand times. So he doubled down on the fact that this wasn't a submarine and couldn't really say what it was, but it was something there. So he actually, and I saw this a few years back, he went on Joe Rogan. You may have saw this uh, mm. as well, where he talked about an incident where he was speaking somewhere in a uh helicopter pilot kind of pulled him aside and and kind of told him hey i've seen some funny stuff too and kind of told this story and we'll go ahead and run that real quick here there's been many instances of sightings off the coast of california of things that plunge into the water or or escape from the water and take off into space so yeah, there, it, with the field propulsion system, as Commander Favors describing, as Lazar described, it doesn't matter the medium of space, air, or water. There's no resistance, no splash. I and mean, this goes back to you know when Christopher Columbus reported a UFO sighting. He this, did. Oh yeah. One of the guys, the story came out, and he was a Navy helicopter pilot. And he comes in. He, he comes in. He goes, dude, "Hey, can I talk to you, man?" I go, "What about?" He goes, "Dude, I got I got to talk to you." And I said, "What do you want to talk to me about?" He says. Dude, do you know your UFO? He said, yeah. He goes, I had a similar experience. I said, what's that? He said, he was flying CH-53s, which is a big lift, heavy lift that the Marine Corps uses, and the Navy uses it for certain things. And when they go off of, for the East Coast, they do a lot of shooting off of, at the time, it was off of Puerto Rico. We had Roosevelt Roads that they ended up closing. Um, but he was flying out of there. And, you know, you got super clear Caribbean water. And they have these things that are called BQMs. They fly around, and then when they're all done, because they'll fly towards the ships, and the ship can—sorry well, about that—they can track with the radar 
And then they also do in the like the ships or submarines shoot torpedoes. They're they're called telemetry rounds. So they have they gather all the data on what the torpedo or is doing underwater, and then they blow ballast, and this thing will come to the surface and float. And then they go pick them up, and then they can extract all the data out of them. So they do it for both. So he said the first time they're out and they're going to pick up this BQM, and those things when they're flying, they're done. A parachute comes out, and they got to go. They hook it up. The helo drops the swimmer in the water. He goes and hooks this whole thing up, and then they hoist the whole thing up and fly back, and then they extract the data. So he says he's sitting in the front. You know, in helicopters, there's, you know, CH-53, you can actually see down by your feet, you know, just like typical, like you go to Hawaii and ride because you can see when you're touching down. So you got really good visibility out of those things, and you can stick your head out the window too because you're just kind of hanging out. He says he's going on there, and they're getting this thing hooked up, and as he's looking down, you know, because they're, I don't know what, 50 feet above the water, he sees kind of this dark mass coming up from the depths. And they start to hoist the... The diver up, and he's got. they've got the BQM, and as they hoist it up, he says, and he's looking at this thing going, what the hell is that? And then it just goes back down underwater. It just like, once they pull the kid and the, the BQM out of the water, this object descends back into the depths. So he thinks, well, that was pretty weird. So he goes out, he says, not too long later, you know, a few months later, he's out, and he's picking up a torpedo. So he says they got the, they hook the diver up on the winch and they're lowering him in. And as he's looking down, he sees this big, massive, he goes, it's not a submarine. He's seen submarines before. Once you see a submarine, you, you can't confuse it with something else. This big object, you know, kind of circular, he says, is coming up from the depths. And he starts screaming to, through the intercom system to tell him to pull the diver up. And the diver's like a few feet from the water. So they reverse the winch and the diver's thinking, what the hell's going on? And he's getting pulled up and all of a sudden... Uh, he said the torpedo just got sucked down underwater, and the object just descended back down into the depths, and they never recovered the the torpedo. Jesus. And this happened in the late 90s, late mid to late 90s, I think it is. I can probably get in touch with him and ask him. And he told me this story, and I'm like, how do you report that? <laughs> you come in and go, well, where'd the torpedo go? It just got sucked down it just went down you know and then you get the people that attribute it as ah something happened when it blew ballast and it just took on water and sank and he's like it didn't sink he goes it literally looked like it got sucked down the only reason they didn't they talked to him when they did the new york times stuff they talked to him but it, because the incident was from the 90s they didn't want to they wanted something you know newer mm. um, so they did not include it but i know they talked to him about it wow wow yeah <laughs> exactly no. Wow, right? Wow. You know, I got to just say, Commander David Fravor, the guy is just so matter of fact. He, right. The guy is, he, he's not making this up. I don't care no. what skeptic comes out. This guy does not make this stuff up. And the person who told him this story is very unique. And I'm, anyhow. I'll, that's now, all I now to, I'll, I'll but comment to, more later. But go no, ahead. no, no. It, it's it's uh, it, dude, dude. The, imagine, and I have some images of what this looked like, so you can kind of see. So the guy is in the water. The 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 the, the guy's in the helicopter with the diver underneath, Getting and he's lowered. looking down. He's looking. Yeah, exactly. He's looking down. Actually, I'll show you what this looks like here. So this is a CH-53. CH-53, yeah. They're, they're heavy lift copters, as he said. I'm familiar with them since I'm kind of a little bit of an aviation buff. They're massive. You can carry a big tank around, as you, they're showing there. And, uh, yeah, so they're using these things to fetch these test torpedoes and these test gathering, test data gathering devices that they used in, I guess, some drills around Puerto Rico. Now, and this is makes what... Sense. This is what uh, he was talking about. They were picking up here, which is one go. of these here. So, okay, this is this shows the diver and, and stuff. how they retrieve it. So let me. Uh, yeah, it's it's not small, so you need something big to pick it up, and you got to pick up people with it. And diver goes down probably to rope onto it or some harness, as you could see there. So Good imagine stuff. that. Imagine that. Imagine something bigger than that coming from the depths. From the bottom, the diver is totally unaware. He's unaware that this is happening. Mm -hmm. The pilot sees this because he's looking down, right? Yeah, and, and, and he diver. pulls him, and the diver's like, he said, "Diver's like, huh? What, what's was going on?" Not knowing that, who knows what would have occurred had he not done that? Who right. who knows? Does he get sucked down with, with the it. device, or? And then we have an incident where a UAP or USO has caused some sort of harm to a human being. And that's where 
gets kind of testy. So we don't know what the intention was there, but here's another uh, clear image of it here. So they're they're pretty big, oh, man. Wow. I guess you they, found they some shoot, you found some good images here. This they, is great stuff. Yeah, they shoot these off, and I don't know, yep. you know, what they do with these. But yeah, I thought that was pretty wild. So with that being said, we have the. 2019 uh a 2019 uso and i don't believe i have any images for this one but this was uh an uh, excerpt from an interview that was done on the tucker carlson show with the guest uh tom rogan from the washington examiner and basically uh he tells tucker carlson's back and forth conversation so i'll be playing tom and i'll be playing tucker too so Mm, Let me see here. So he says the late 2019 incident essentially involved a U.S. carrier strike group, as with the incident in 2004 and 15, doing its workups on pre-deployment, preparing to go abroad and do the missions that the Navy are assigned, Rogan said. And the pilots are flying off the east or off the coast of the Atlantic seaboard and see essentially a black triangle white sort of indicator lights on its peripheral tips coming out of the water very quickly and then accelerating at extremely high speed at about nine at 90 degree angle. And one of the pilots took a photo, very good photo I'm told by multiple sources on his iPhone. And then Tucker says it came out of the water. There have been, there have been over the years, a number of reports of unidentified underwater vehicles moving in ways that don't make any sense at all. Tell us what you know about that. Rogan then told Tucker that the reason the Navy doesn't publicize this stuff is because they don't want, quote, either China or Russia, ugh, in particular, to figure out whatever these vehicles are, figure out how they do what they do. They maneuver in ways that would essentially render a submarine or an aircraft carrier or any, quite frankly, military warship extremely vulnerable to attack, Rogan told Tucker. This is some special stuff, whatever it is. It says Tucker was awestruck. It says, well, a bullet doesn't travel hundreds of knots an hour underwater for long. I mean, I don't think any human-made object ever has. We've never imagined something like that, Tucker Gate. Though the, the genre of science fiction might disagree with that statement, Rogan then wrapped up his spiel stating, what these things can do in air, underwater, in space, at least in low orbit, are beyond any capability that we can identify with an Earth nation either in platform, something that a military is showing or is in development, he told Carson, or has ever been conceived of, Tucker replied. I mean, let's be honest, this is really out of the realm. So Tucker Carlson, think whatever you may of the guy, one, you know, he's a national reporter who's uh, open to covering the topic and, yep. and getting the conversation going. And I, re him I respect that. him for that for sure. Yeah. Um, and 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 there needs to be more outlets that do the same. And this is the only way that we're gonna let the masses understand what is actually happening. I mean, you you there's as a kid, uh I was in, I'm from Northern California, uh, Sacramento. So we would go out to San Francisco and uh board charter boats, charter fishing boats, salmon uh, boats, mm -hmm. and we would drive under the Golden Gate Bridge and we would Go drive for sea. miles until you could see no land in either direction. And mm -hmm. we're in a we're in a big boat per se, but when you're in the middle of the ocean like that, it doesn't seem really that big. Yep. And there's a lot of people that go out there this way that have no idea that yeah, there's big, there's whales and all sorts of creatures under there, but they have no idea that there's, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say something that could harm them, but just like Lou Elizondo said, uh, it, you know, it could do something if it wanted to. And to be vulnerable is we're land-based animals uh, in the middle of the ocean. 
it's something to think about and something you should think about. Um, you know, not I don't want anyone to stop going on the water, uh, but at the same time, it's just having the knowledge so you can make your own informed decision on what it what it is that you want to do with your life. What do you think mm -hmm. about that? Interesting. Thanks for asking. Here's here's what I want to say. Everything points to the fact that what you just described very well could be a threat. Is it a threat? That's the big question. My personal opinion is it definitely has the potential to be a threat, but I don't think it is a threat that any of us have to worry about. So we should not be afraid to go out on the water in the fishing boat or on your cruise ship. And I've done that too, as a youth, where we go out of sight of land, right? And it's it's kind of freaky when you're on a small boat, especially. Oh, it and is. Um, I don't think th there is any, may, not all of these, not all of the phenomena may be benevolent, but the bulk of it clearly is otherwise we would have all been the, our demise would have been sealed long ago right so right. i don't think there's an obvious threat here an imminent threat to any of this but the threat potential is clearly there and i got to give you props again you found another under publicized case here an under under publicized uh set of facts that was obviously on national tv and on tuck carlson's show but look at how compelling this is. I mean, we, we've got these this this going on in the Navy once again, and all of this stuff is going on. And, and what does it what does it mean? It, nobody's talking about it, and especially this case in particular. And I, I don't know. I just find the more the digger the deeper you dig, <laughs> in, in in and along the lines of your show title. The deeper you dig, the more you find. And I had never heard of this particular case or report. It, it's, I think, I find it very this compelling. Was oh, this was only four years ago that this yeah. incident happened? No, oh, yeah, this is right recent history. It's not like something that. And where's that iPhone photo? Right, that's obviously right. Now that's what up. I want to right. <laughs> So hopefully that comes out. See, that's the type of stuff we need. We need that stuff to come out. I mean, yeah. well, that's a lot that of that military be classified stuff. if it's an iPhone photo. You know what well, I mean? He was doing on military duty, so you know uh, everything was probably classified. See, but that's the thing, and I'm happy to hear that he, they said that because one of my big beasts is like everybody's got a, a, a high resolution still and video camera in their hand. Why aren't there more pictures? Why aren't there more pictures? Well, here's a case where a picture got taken, but it'll never get, likely never get released. Well, back right? to the point we were just saying. I mean, just like with the 50 people who probably saw this quarter mile long craft come out the water right. and didn't report it. Was that 2017? They had right. smartphones. Come on. And so, so imagine then how many people, most likely, mo most likely all in the military, because otherwise mm -hmm. I'm sure I, I would wow. hope a regular person would come forward with something like that or maybe they have and that's the other part of it where you have uh uh where sightings of normal people get discredited and it could be the real deal and that's why we go back to every sighting matters because yes uh, some of this stuff that's been debunked um just like for instance when mick west debunked my own sighting and debunked uh no the longbow 281 was debunked but I have reason to believe uh, from just things that I've seen that my case obviously authentic. And then that case is authentic. These are cases that have been debunked in the open in the public. So imagine how many other real cases have been uh, debunked away and claimed as something else. So, you know, and that kind of when you start unpeeling the onion, then you're really seeing what the real problem is here. Yes. You know what I mean? And what we need to correct. So with that, there's Great another stuff. incident here that I saw. And, and I remember when this was reported, when this happened, and not a lot. It, it, they tried to war play this one. And um, this one is the U.S. submarine hitting an unknown object in the South China Sea. Do you recall this story? Oh, yeah. 
So for those who may not be up to speed on this yes. one, uh, a U.S. nuclear submarine hit an unknown object while submerged in waters in the Asia-Pacific region, injuring a number of sailors, U.S. officials say. So it's not clear what caused the incident on, on uh, Saturday, they said. The submarine remained fully operational. Unnamed officials told U.S. media the collision happened in international waters in the South China Sea and that 11 sailors had been injured. The incident happened amid rising tensions in the region. The U.S. Navy said the extent of the damage was still being assessed and that the submarine's nuclear propulsion, propulsion plant and spaces had not been affected. The statement did not give details about where the incident took place or the number of people hurt, saying only that the injuries were not life-threatening. But two officials quoted by the Associated Press said two of the 11 sailors that were hurt had injuries that were classified as moderate. All of them were treated on board the submarine. Now, those officials said the incident took place while the submarine was conducting routine operations and that the Navy did not make the news public before Thursday in order to maintain operational security. Now, according to AP, the officials say the object the USS Connecticut collided with was not another submarine. One of the officials quoted by the agency said it could have been a sunken vessel or a container or other uncharted object. So Anna Alexander Neal, a Singapore-based defense and security expert, told the BBC the number of injuries caused by the collision suggested the submarine probably hit something big and was going really fast. So... Obviously, they didn't say that this was UAP, but they did state that it was uh, not another submarine and that it was an unknown object under the water. So you could take that with the grain of salt and, and to make the decision on what you think about that. But what is your opinion on that, Mattel? Hmm. This one, I remember hearing some follow up press as well that said to go along with all the facts you just cited that the damage was actually quite extensive. Now, when it kind of finally got back to port, and I think they tried to cover that up a little bit. So, yes, what they hit was big, and there was speculation about running into some uncharted underwater, you know, terrain. But, come on, in spite of what we know, the bottom of the ocean isn't, entirely mapped worldwide these vessels have the ability to detect what's there and what's not there they're not going to crash run themselves aground so to speak into a mountain in the ocean inadvertently especially if they're doing high speed something got in their way yeah you know, what that something is was big yes could it have been a container sneak sinking down from above or floating there of of course, because containers, you'd be shocked as to how many containers fall off of container ships around the world. But they would have seen that. They have sonar. They would have seen it coming. They could have avoided True. it. And, of course, it's not like something that big. They hit something way bigger than that. True. And so that really, that made me wonder. Because there was some, and at first I thought, ah, they ran into um, an underwater terrain but now there this there was more behind this than than meets the eye so you my opinion is there's that. something going on that they're hiding and will be forever be hiding with this one yes exactly and reason why i wanted to talk about that yes. because it's evident that i mean they now they didn't mention that it for sure wasn't a submarine it was like, okay maybe they had another submarines a lot of them down there but uh yeah you state it's not a submarine and I would assume as long as these subs stay down, that they are pretty familiar with the terrain in the areas that they're in. So I don't even see how that's an issue, how that would ever become an issue. And then, like you said, containers, uh, they should be able to pick that up on sonar easily. Mm -hmm. So it just leaves that other category for this one. So I personally feel like this could be USO related 
can't say for sure, obviously, but it's compelling at the least. Mm -hmm. Now, the next one that we have here is one that uh, this one is kind of creepy. This one is uh, the Lake Baikal incident in uh, Russia, 1982. Mm, yes. This is a pretty famous one that a lot of people should know about. And if you don't, uh, listen to this. In 1977, so 45 years ago, two researchers named V. Alexandrov and G. Silvest Sil Silverstov were in a submersible device at a depth of 1,200 meters in the lake. So that's 3,600 feet in a lake. It's, it's actually uh, the number one, the biggest lake with the uh, most fresh water. I don't know how they put it. It's like 20% uh, of the Earth's fresh water is contained in that lake. Hmm. So the researchers turned off their spotlights to explore the depth of penetration of sunlight into the water. Suddenly, the scientists were bathed in light from an unusual glow. Alexandrov recalled, it was so like if our device was lit from above and the side by two strong spotlights. Only a minute later, unknown floodlights went out and we found ourselves in total darkness. So this is, uh, and then in 1970, this, I guess that's the fir uh, first incident they had there. And then this is the one where they encountered the et so in 1982 same lake seven military divers were reported to have come across aliens under the waters of baikal alexi tevinico a doctor of history said at a depth of 50 meters they met swimmers around three meters tall so it's like 10 feet tall dressed in tight fitting silvery suits they did not have any scuba or other devices just helmets on their heads as pictured in this on the screen here. Mm -hmm. They received an order to catch uh, the, they call it a uh, I it under, which I guess to them in their Russian folklore is a half boy, half shark. Uh, but they were immediately washed ashore with signs of decompression. So from what I had heard, they had tried to, uh, capture one of these they were ordered to capture one of these things and it uh fought back it it just gave some sort of pulse that kind of pushed out and and blew them essentially back up through the hole that they came in um and they suffered decompression because they surfaced too quickly so they received an order to catch the 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 thing um they said they had two decompression devices uh, but one was broken. So out of the seven people that went into the lake, uh, all seven couldn't fit inside of one. So they they could only put four of them in. And those three people who couldn't get in, uh, putting the device died on the beach. So Tivanenko has likened this, the descriptions to ancient petroglyphs seen by some as being aliens visiting Earth says he have hundreds of drawings of these sons of the sky. It says they are united by the fact that all of them are tall, dressed in suits, all with helmets on their heads, and there are mechanisms used by astronauts today. So this was wild. I, I know when I first heard this, I was like, ah. but then I learned that this was like an ancient lake. Um, and then one of the, or the deepest lake in the world and if we already know that we have things here in the ocean, why not? Why not this lake? So I'm inclined to uh, to. I'm inclined to accept that story, I'll say that. Uh, what do you say? Hmm. You know what this case reminded me of immediately when I first heard it a while ago was remember that movie, The Abyss with yes. uh, I think 1989. Um, yeah, with that, that's that's kind of what this a lot movie, like it. This yeah. reminded me of. Now, in that case, you know the the visitors were in charge. Here, it seemed as if we were the, this this Russian group was trying to capture some of them, and some may have uh, been killed as a result. But it, it may it reminds me of that case. 
the only thing about it is, is that this is a close encounter of the third kind, right? So there's where they've got bodies apparently. So uh, where's the evidence? That's the only uh, where did any of that evidence ever come out? But, well, uh, see that. Well, the thing was, was supposedly they they didn't uh, they they didn't capture any of these guys. Okay. So yeah, there were seven uh, divers that went in, and then there were three beings ten feet tall. So yeah, they didn't get to catch them. They they essentially blew the guys back out the water. Yeah. So and what was the three died. divers who washed? Yeah. The floor? Oh, okay. they died from decompression. They died. So, okay. Yes. I'm, exactly. I misunderstood. Yeah. Yeah. So th this is yeah. It's just like that movie again. All right. So no, yeah, there, there's that outcome doesn't surprise and, me. <laughs> well, here's the thing too. So I've always said, you know, I talk to people because some people think that they'll say, okay, well, we feel like ETs were here first. Like this is their planet, and then, uh, and so I said, okay, I question that with, okay, why would they move? It, it, I would have to assume then if they are in the ocean and we're on land, they were here first, that they would have to be aquatic creatures because why else would they give up the land to us? Why would they give us the land to move into the ocean if they're not comfortable being in water? So that kind of fuels, you know, my belief in this story because a part of me feels like at least one of these species uh, may actually be, you know, an aquatic uh, species. So this, if this is true, then this would kind of lean into that and would make a lot more sense why these things are underwater and in the ocean. So it, you know, it's just something to, something to get you thinking. It makes a lot of sense once you start connecting the dots. Now, obviously we don't know uh, what's true or not, what parts of that could be, you know, sensationalized, but, uh, for the most part, connecting the dots, everything seems to line up so far. So, and then move, and, and really, that one also shows an event where they actually, even though they we were intending to capture them, uh, their defense mechanism ended up killing humans. So this is a case where ETs underwater outcome was humans human casualties mm -hmm. so with that being said we have this one here the next one which is tom delong now a lot of people have things just like abilo they have a lot of things to say about tom delong and uh where he's at in this conversation but mm -hmm. tom delong told a story on the steve-o podcast uh where he says he was privy to some information which we know in the beginning he did have dealings with the government and secret meetings and so he tells this story and uh, it's pretty compelling so let's go ahead and listen to tom delong it's nature so we got to kind of confront it regardless but it's very real it's insanely bigger than you think it is it's not just a few things in the sky it's very very big i got brought over to Italy. Uh, some dudes with Italian um, intelligence in Vatican and UN, they were all there, went to military base, had these briefings, and they showed me a map of the Mediterranean. And what was happening was, is on the coast of Sicily, all these like apartments were like catching on fire. Like a microwave, boom, some books, boom, like the fucking couch, boom. And so the government came in and they're like, what the fuck is going on here? So they quarantined the area, get everyone to leave, and they're going, why are things catching on fire? They detected, they detected these um, energy beams, energy weapons, or something that were coming off of the like, way out in the ocean in the Mediterranean. So this dude gets, uh, he, he was a colonel at the time and he was in charge. Oh, what they looked out and saw were UFOs were out in the ocean fucking around. So the head of the UFO program and the head of the Italian Navy SEALs get on an unmarked civilian helicopter and just fly out to go see what's going on out there. As they're flying, a UFO pops out of the ocean and shoots their fucking helicopter down. I have the documents on the Italian intelligence letterhead. I talked to the dude, the two dudes I was in the meeting with that were on the fucking helicopter. I have pictures of the helicopter being chased by the <laughs> UFO and all the damage that was done to it with some type of microwave weapon or something. And what they found out was that there were airplanes and other helicopters kind of in the area, but the UFO knew that those dudes were looking for him. So 
if you believe Tom DeLonge, then that story is freaking crazy. He says he saw the pictures that this incident took place. A USO popped up out of the water, shot the helicopter down, and then went back into the water. What's your opinion on that? I guess the helicopter made it back to land and they were able to photograph it. So uh, obviously something shot it, right? That's uh, now, and apparently the beams of light that ultimately drew them out there that were setting things on fire, as he described. I mean, there has to be dozens of witnesses to that. So once again, it's a case very anecdotal, right? It's all hearsay, but one, hard to make something up like this, right? Given all the pieces, what led to it, the military gets involved because of these beams of energy are setting things on fire. They see activity over the water. They go out there, they have an encounter, and they limp back and live to tell the story. Um wild i mean i'd love to hear some i don't know if any of those witnesses were ever uh interviewed separately i vaguely remember something along those lines i know he's recounting the story but i actually do recall hearing about this story from another source years ago but once again these are these stories that just don't get talked about and how significant is this right <laughs> this is not only a uso it's a uso that opened fire and Tom DeLonge is a rock star. He's the Blink-82 uh, yeah. lead singer, Blink-182. And and why would why would he have any reason to sit up and just tell this story? No, this I think this, I've heard this story before him telling it, I believe. I think this was covered in some very old documentary at one point. So no, he's not, he's recounting a, a, a story that's real. He didn't make this up. Yeah. And he, but yeah, it's w the evidence that he possesses, that he claims to possess. Why isn't he revealing that? Right. And that, right that, now that that's the other side. And that's been the criticism right. of a lot of these guys uh, who have information. So, yeah, I mean, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's the dollar at the end of the day uh, that'll make these things show up. Uh, we know money rules the world is the root of all evil. It makes the world go round. Um, and may, maybe that's what it takes. Maybe a big enough check. And, and speaking of that, that's uh, kind of sidetracked. That's what James uh, Fox was kind of hinting towards when he was uh, talking about getting more info on the Virginia case that he referred to. Um, it was, it was a monetary value attached to him being able to retrieve the information. So, but in this world that we live in, uh, money uh, maybe is king. he had to give people some money. Yeah, cash was king, and I guess he had talked about there was a dollar amount that they he was trying to get it wrangled in, but it was going to be a substantial dollar amount. So I mean, and maybe that's the key. Maybe people just you know feel like, hey, this is the one time that I'll get to be able to monetize my experience, yeah. and maybe I just don't want to give it out. Thinking for themselves yeah. uh, instead of all of humanity, all which of humanity. in some cases you can't really blame them, kind of, you know, because it's been designed that uh, money is what uh, you need to survive and mm -hmm. to take care of your family. So and maybe that's the outlook that they're having. So kind of just putting this all in, into perspective. So I did have one more uh, clip and this was just kind of something that I had found uh mark d'antonio who is is on like proof the proof is out there different yes. shows where he um uh, analyzes photos and videos to and and sometimes debunks them sometimes he doesn't but he it surprised me that he had this take and this is from a few years back he appeared on a podcast uh let, let me let you hear what he said i was doing work for the navy and uh it's, it's sort of as a thank you they said hey do you want to go on a ride i went a ride in, in what a car a plane what, where and they said a submarine i was like what wow what a great idea i'd love to so i was sitting at one of the sonars that was active but but you know i there was nobody manning it there was a kid next to me on the right and he was manning his sonar and basically uh, i was trying to just zone out and get rid of my seasickness and i was feeling much better actually it was helping me and all of a sudden i'm jolted awake 
by the kid uh, calling the con, the, the command, and said, con sonar, con sonar, fast mover, fast mover. And I woke up thinking, what, what, what the heck? We're going to be killed. We're going to die. I'm going to die out here by a torpedo or something. Because to me, I was thinking fast mover meant torpedo. And the executive officer comes around and he sits over the kid's shoulder and says, what do you got? And I think, I mean, it's loud on a sub, so you got to keep in mind it's loud. It's not, it's not like it's very quiet. They always make it sound like, oh, it's very quiet. Yeah, from the outside. But inside, you've got high pressure air, you've got noise, you've got people talking, you've got machinery. But the Navy prides itself on that sound not getting out. So anyway, um, I couldn't hear everything he said, the, the bearing, the range, you know, you know, where it was basically. Uh, but when it came to the speed, I leaned forward on the edge of my seat, which was locked down to the floor. And uh, I had just a tiny little bit of my butt on the seat because I was way over just trying to listen in. And when the kid told him how fast it was moving, I think all three of us were dumbfounded. Um, me by eavesdropping and the other two by, you know, the kid never saw something like this before, but the XO, I think, had. And because uh, the kid said, and when the XO asked, how fast is it moving? And the kid said, several hundred knots, sir. And the executive officer just said, okay, log it and dog it. I got up and I went over to the executive officer because after all, hey, I was invited to be on this sub. I was a big, important person, right? I walked over to the executive officer and he said, XO, I know what these fast mover things are. Maybe I can help you. And he put his hand on my shoulder and said, Mr. D'Antonio, are you having a good time so far? Yes, sir, I am. Let's keep it that way. And he walked away. And so I, I kind of learned that even by invitation, you can't get to see everything, even if you have the right clearance, you know, which I did. But it's only a need to know thing. So anyway, uh, a couple of years later, I had to do a job for a very powerful group in Washington, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They advised the president of the United States. And when I uh, did the project, I had to deliver it. And I delivered it to uh, one of the members who it turned out to become a friend. And I asked him in the privacy of his own home, what can you tell me about this fast mover program? And he looked at me and he goes, I can't talk about that program, Mark. I'm sorry. He could have said, what program? I, I never heard of that. He didn't. And I was just stunned. So he basically said nothing but said everything. So there Boom. Boom. <laughs> what? What? So now we're up to several hundred knots underwater. Dude, I mean, so you have heard of the potential of UAP or UFOs, USOs being underwater. You have heard of occasional this or that. When you look at this collective of data that we just went through here, I think it's been laid out in a way that you can pretty much not even deny the fact that there has to be something to this. So even if you only go with one of these cases that we just looked at, you have to lean towards at least one of these stories has weight to it and they're all compelling. So if one of them is true, there's a good chance that more of them are true. And, uh, you know, there were some that that we could have included in this that we left out on purpose because uh, the people involved uh, didn't have great track records. Um, and and I, I think that we picked the best of the best of the bunch. So you what do you did, think about man. this? What do you think about that? You certainly did. Rob, you picked an outstanding set of cases that uh, several of which I had didn't have any knowledge of, like this last one. I didn't know Mark D'Antonio got invited on a submarine and had this experience. I mean, there's proof positive right there, if you take his word, that because he's had clearances, but apparently he was felt free enough to talk about this incident fast moving object we don't possess technology to go several hundred knots underwater nobody does i mean torpedoes don't go that fast i mean anyhow i as you just said the fact that the report or the incidents are so numerous and you've cited several real compelling ones here all it takes is one to be true and then um 
a very good chance that a lot of them are true. It's like what I say about life in the universe. As soon as you find one cellular life somewhere on some other planet, then life is likely everywhere, right? Uh, yeah. Same in this case. If one of these turns out to be true, very likely a lot of the other ones are, are true as well. So... Yeah, man. There's uh, the weight of the evidence is heavy here, right? As is Very. the case for all of UA, UAP investigations, and we're just talking about the USOs here. It's a great topic, once again. Very, very compelling, and and, and this is something that I know if you go back and watch, is just going to become even that much more compelling. And we need to put together. And this is an example of uh, what we could have. If everybody brought their information together, that's all we did here today is we yes. brought the information together to paint to paint a full picture of what is is actually going on out there. So I think we nailed it truthfully uh, as far as that goes. You did. Now, with that being said. We have some uh, we have some fun stuff, uh, some more fun stuff to get into, as you see at the bottom of the screen. We have a couple more segments, and when you hear this music, you know that we're going to get into once upon a time in ufology. And we're going to talk about the UFOs over the White House, 1952. So, from July 12th to 29th, 1952, a series of unidentified flying objects, UFO sightings, were reported in Washington, D.C., and later became known as the Washington Flap, the Washington Airport, National Airport Sightings, or the Invasion of Washington. At 11.40 p.m. on Saturday, July 19th, 1952, Edward Nugent, an air traffic controller at Washington National Airport, today named Ronald Reagan Washington air National Airport, spotted seven objects on his radar. The objects were located 15 miles south-southwest of the city. No known aircraft were in the area, and the objects were not following any established flight paths. Nugent Superior Harry Barnes, a senior air traffic controller at the airport, watched the objects on Nugent's radar scope. He later wrote, We knew immediately that a very strange situation existed. Their movements were completely radical compared to those of ordinary aircraft. Barnes had two controllers check Nugent's radar. They found that it was working normally. Barnes then called National Airport's radar-equipped control tower, the controllers there, Howard Cochran and Joe Zacco, said that they also had unidentified blips on their radar screen and saw a hovering bright light in the sky, which departed at incredible speed. Cochran asked Zacco, did you see that? What the hell was that? At this point, other objects appeared in all sectors of the radar scope when they moved over the White House and the United States Capitol. Barnes called Andrews Air Force Base, located 10 miles from the National Airport. Although Andrews reported that they had no unusual objects on their radar, an airman soon called the base's control tower to report the sighting of a strange object. Airman Willie, William Brady, who was in the tower, then saw an object which appeared to be like an orange ball of fire trailing a tail. It was unlike anything I had seen before. As Brady tried to alert the other personnel in the tower, the strange object took off at an unbelievable speed. One of the National Airport's runways, S.C. Pierman, a Capital Airlines pilot, was waiting in the cockpit of his DC-4 for permission to take off. After spotting what he believed to be a meteor, he was told that the control tower's radar had detected unknown objects closing in on his position. Pierman observed six objects, white, tailless, fast-moving lights, over a 14-minute period. Pierman was on the radio contact with Barnes during the sighting, and Barnes later related that each sighting coincided with the pip 
we could see near his plane. When he reported that the light streaked off at high speed, it disappeared on our scope. Meanwhile, at Andrews Air Force Base, the control tower personnel were tracking on radar what some thought to be unknown objects, but others suspected, and in one instance were able to prove, were simply stars and meteors. However, Staff Sergeant Charles Davenport observed an orange-red light to the south. The light would appear to stand still, then make an abrupt change in direction and altitude. This happened several times. At one point, both radar centers at National Airport and the radar at Andrews Air Force Base were tracking an object hovering over a, a radio beacon. The object vanished in all three radi radar centers at the same time. At 3 a.m. shortly before two U United States Air Force F-94 Starfire jet fighters from Newcastle Air Force Base in Delaware arrived over Washington, all of the objects vanished from the radar at National Airport. However, when the jets ran low on fuel and left, the objects returned, which convinced Barnes that the UFOs were monitoring radio traffic and, and behaving accordingly. The objects were last detected by radar at 5.30 a.m. Bananas. Sounds like David Fravor in the Tic Tac in the cap point. Mm -hmm. There was so, uh, corroborating radars, corroborating witnesses. Uh, and the and, feeling that they knew what, what the game plan was. So they right. were mo monitoring radio signals. And they're saying this in 1952. 52. Yeah. And they were exhibiting some of the five observables. And right? a, so this, the five this observables. is not meteors and this isn't stars. Come on. Air traffic control people do not mistake meteors for uh, things for me, uh, you know, meteors for anomalous aircraft, please. That's an insult. And in fact, I remember seeing uh, a an, an documentary once where one of those air traffic controllers was interviewed and he was really he was really insulted because I guess didn't MUFON investigate or not MUFON Blue Book investigated this case and brushed it off as some silliness you know not swamp gas but some other phenomenon that of well, course was prosaic and it was an insult to everyone involved i i'd be intrigued to know and and maybe there's something to look into is how many actual cases uh are, are going on in that dc area in current times it couldn't have stopped in 1952 so i wonder do they still have sightings there and are they things are they things that potentially they just cover up and don't say anything to us about at this point because obviously if word got out in current day that we had just just look at the chinese balloon the spy balloon it, it uh got nowhere near dc and it, they blew it up into this big thing so imagine if they ever said they had something anomalous in dc that they couldn't understand or couldn't do anything about what message that was sent uh to the to the public today what do you think about that oh that would be blow that would blow up in a heartbeat right i mean you, you couldn't hide from that story because that At would immediately all. be you know not you know not only is the uh, country's uh, sovereignty being violated but the capital right the the, the the crown jewel washington dc if something were to go on there it w you wouldn't be able to hold it back to your point is it ha how often is it happening i would it's kind of hard to say what is there three there's two airports and them and andrews air force base there so i mean there's a lot of eyes in the sky my gut tells me it isn't happening very often and if it does then it's not as prevalent as this case was where there were a lot of witnesses but and no no right once again we don't know there's a lot well, of air traffic controllers probably deal with a lot and they you know, just don't say anything and then the filters they have on the radar might be something that plays <laughs> into it because yeah. you know you have ryan graves who was flying off the East Coast uh, for two years. They were seeing objects every day for a period of two years. So how close was that to D.C.? Why would they be immune from 
traveling over to that area. So I think that's something we should look into and maybe uh, there might be something to uncover there. So maybe mm-hmm. that'll be something we'll bring up on another show. Mm-hmm. Hey, Greg O'Brien, thanks for coming through, man. Oh, Greg, he says he lives in D.C. There is so much. There is so much air traffic around here. Now, we say air traffic. Do you mean anomalous or just traffic in general? I think he means traffic in general. There's a lot of, but uh, he can answer that. But yeah, I I can imagine it's through the two airports and the Air Force Base. It's it's crowded skies there, right? Yeah. And and it's protected, right? It's a protected space. Yeah, he says airplanes. It's a protected space. There's a lot of no-fly zones, of course, for obvious reasons. It's got to be nuts there. So I would imagine. I mean, and you you think about the... uh, O'Hare incident where the thing just sat right over the mm. the tarmac, and this is in current time, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, but still, you know, it sat right there in plain sight, didn't care that it was being viewed, and then performed an anomalous act right in front of everybody. They people were able to get pictures of it. So it, it, yeah, it, and I guess if they ever admitted that they saw some of these things in D.C., they would have to admit a lot more than after that. You know what I mean? So yep. I think that's that's what it could be. But, yeah, I think so. This is Once Upon a Time Ufology. Once again, this is, uh, you know, a lot of the, like we say all the time, a lot of the veterans in ufology know about these things, these stories. These are mainly for Uh, A lot of people just coming on board, just realizing uh, that this thing is real and uh, that that are thirsty for information on this on the subject. So we do this every episode. Uh, We will be doing this again on Friday, um, which is Friday Night Live. So make sure you guys are there for that. And we will be sliding into the fun part of the show, which is obviously science fiction to science facts movie edition and what do we have for that what do we have for that this week? one of my we have one of my favorites which is signs starring mel gibson awesome movie awesome movie depicting Maybe not the so good side of how things could be. Uh, swing away, these, <laughs> swing away, Merle. Uh, with these ETs being here, but it was, uh, I guess it kind of would, would not to spoil it, but I guess you'll see when you watch it if you haven't seen it. Um, but like I say, the whole point of science fiction to science fact once again is to just look at these movies through a new lens. Uh, now that we know that these things are here and in our skies and under our oceans, uh, that they are here, they are present and, uh, looking at the movie again and I, you just, it feels different. It just feels different when you watch these again. So this week is, it's going to be signs. We might do another one on Friday. Um, but yeah, so, Hey, let me go ahead and wrap this up. Because we've been here, we've we've kept everybody here. It's been about an hour and forty five minutes, so we're gonna science fiction, science fact out of that, and then we're gonna get to our cool take us home vibes. Awesome show, man! This was really good topic. You 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 really dug up some great stories here, man. Really. Hey. Did appreciated and you know how we we are committing to raising the bar every time and uh bringing people you know pertinent information it may not be the uh the top news of the hour per se but i think it holds a lot of value and uh it, it's a lot of replay value as well so if you have somebody that uh is just kind of understanding what's going on um you know this is a good show to bring them into come and have them come in and join the conversation and let's all learn together because uh you know there's a lot of podcasts a lot of shows out there where you know 
the host wants to be you know the all-knowing all-seeing uh person to give the information and truth is no one has the answer we're all speculating and figuring this thing out together and and here at the social dig we're gonna dig up the most pertinent things that make sense and put them together in a way that hopefully uh get you to you know understand what 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 we're trying to convey here so do you have anything to say to the people here mateo before we get up out of here no all i want to say is uh thanks again thanks for to uh, magneticus and Greg magneticus for joining Greg us and all day everyone else out there the you know your show covers the present too rob you, you do your news segment in the beginning yep we yep. talk about a few of the breaking news events and then we do a little bit of this middle history and then some of the uh the once it's upon a, good a time balance. it's a nice balance and as you said for the newcomers to the uap uh phenomenon community there's a rich history here i mean i lived it and i grew up in it and it's you can't ignore it it's different now but you can't ignore that history you have to understand if you understand that history it makes a lot what's going on today it means a whole lot more that's that's my view so awesome stuff man <laughs> so oh but uh, magnetica said what's that grinding rail sound that was actually the music uh playing behind uh science fiction science fact yeah yeah the, it's an alien theme uh and then magnetic is again potatoes o'brien sounds good now <laughs> i guess that may be in honor of saint patrick's day coming up friday huh we'll and have to it, do something we'll have to wear green on friday and, and greg o'brien so potatoes o'brien and greg o'brien because he's <laughs> Cause he's hungry so go. man glad you guys came through like i said we're gonna keep doing it we're not gonna stop we're gonna be back we're gonna be back twice a week we're gonna be bringing the information we hope that you guys come through like you're doing now uh if you're on team rewatch definitely hit those like buttons if you're coming through for the first time hit the subscribe button think of coming back you know the motto of the show is come join the conversation that's that's what we're doing here. We, we would love to have a community that we could talk to. You know, Greg and Magneticus are, are we already know their knowledge, the knowledge that they have. And I would, you know, Greg uh, is featured on a few shows. I would love to have Greg come through and hang out with us. So if he's down with it, please let me know, Greg, and we'll definitely have you come through. Um, but with that being said, let's go ahead and get up out of here. This is Mr. Rob G. Mateo in the building. He's the engineer at the Social Dig. And uh, we just want to thank everybody for coming through. Hope you uh, got some value out of the show today. I don't want to say I love you guys, but I love you guys because we're all humanity. That's you right. know what I mean? And you're all my brothers and we're all brothers and sisters. And let's go ahead and uh, get it going. So Greg's, Greg's totally down. DM him. We're doing a show on Friday, Greg. Uh, I'll be hitting you up soon. Other than that, Magneticus, you already know you have an uh, invitation as well. I haven't seen you show up anywhere, but if you, you are more than willing, welcome uh, to come on as well. And I know you have a lot of good points too. So uh, with that being said, hit me up on Twitter, uh, at Mr. Rob G. Instagram, at Mr. Rob G youtube at mr rob g the social dig thanks for coming through you guys all take care